from the Gothic Quarter in Barcelona. This is Market Movers, the podcast that gives you a closer look at the financial markets to trade responsibly. Here are your hosts, Lior Cohen and Yohai Elam. Hello and welcome, and thank you for joining us in Spreading the Good Word. This is episode number 77, recorded on Thursday, November 19th. I'm your co-host, Leo Cohen, and joining me, it took him a minute to fall asleep from reading the Fed's minutes, Yochai Ilam. How's it going, Yochai? Hi, Leo. Yeah, this is always a boring document, and this time they, they even out, they did themselves. It was nothing, yeah. Well, I think that's what they were aiming at, right? Just to make us fall asleep as soon as possible, so no one will actually talk about it so we'll have another month or so of uh, just ease before we're getting to the final uh, event of uh, of the year the feds uh, meeting at uh, this in december yeah all right yeah so this week we'll tackle the recent minutes of uh, the fed review the latest news from paris thanksgiving trading and a preview for the main events of the week but first let's start off with uh, the tragic events that happened over the weekend in paris our thoughts and uh, condolences to the victims and the uh, of this hor- horrific uh, events, of course. Unfortunately, we're a little bit familiar with it from uh, coming from Israel. But uh, turning from the actual news that happened, let's try to make a spin and just see how these events, if any, had an impact on uh, the markets. How do uh, how did the investors and traders reacted to this news? I mean, when you look at it, basically, it's supposed to be a, a pretty straightforward thing, right? That if there is a bad news coming from uh, from a part of the world especially some somewhere so prominent as paris then uh, markets should react accordingly and they'll have some an adverse impact more risk in the more people are a little bit the markets are a little bit more volatile people react a little bit more harshly to these news but is that what actually transpired what what, what uh, where do you stand on it you well first of all it happened uh, we heard the first uh, word about that just as markets uh, were closing in the united states basically uh, the tragedy unfolded while markets were closed. So we didn't have the immediate knee-jerk um, emergency reaction, if you wish, but the markets had time to digest everything before they reopened in Asia about 48 hours after we began hearing the terrible news. And so I think um, markets had time to understand what happened and what's going on. Oh, okay. And uh, from uh, so let's just break it down a little bit from the perspective of uh, commodities, uh, the Forex markets, the Euro. Let's start with the Euro. How did that react i mean we have seen that the euro has uh, declined in the past in the first couple of days of the starting of the week right yeah but i find it hard to, first of all it uh, it did rise and sort of um against the dollar on this risk off uh, behavior safe haven well not exactly safe haven more uh, funding currency we've mentioned this in the past that because of the negative deposit rates and uh, the ecb's printing euros become a funding currency and at times of trouble money comes back so when we first heard the initial news the last the dying hours of the week we had uh, some rise in the euro and this was but this was quite minimal 30 40 pips and it was reversed on monday we had a small uh, sunday gap what's called weekend gap and then uh, it closed back down and from then on it traded more according to the regular monetary policy divergence so i would say the impact was minimal oh okay so we haven't seen much from that from commodities we have seen that oil at least uh, shot up the first uh, day of the week on monday but then the, the media afterwards has uh, declined soon after and so we cannot say that uh, and also for uh, precious metals they've also they've they've risen on monday then they declined the following day so we can say that from the commodities perspective there has been as as it should i think uh, shouldn't be any much of a reaction from it but um, let's turn to the to where maybe things could have happened and uh, that's c- come uh, when we look at equities so in equities uh, it's a little bit interesting because if you look at it uh, as i said we would expect to see something uh, maybe a little bit of a sell-off of equities especially in france but if you look at the CAC uh, 40, if you look at the average closing price uh, in the last three days compared to where it was the average on the three days before uh, before the tragedy transpired, then you see that actually prices on average has gone up a little bit. So we cannot say that uh, there was much of an adverse reaction. The only 
thing I can say that is uh, apparent from uh, from the data is that the uh, volume traded volume has declined substantially in the past uh, several days as uh, we would expect right I mean the, the distraction the yeah yeah I mean people uh, trade less uh, especially in Europe not in the US by the way in the US uh, volume hasn't de hasn't declined the S&P the volume actually has gone up uh, in the last uh, several days so we cannot say there was much of a reaction there but but uh, in Europe, uh, in the COC 40, in the IBEX uh, 35, in the FTSE, DAX, all the big, uh, the major markets, we we have seen that there was a decline in volume traded, but not in the closing prices. So they still continue to rise, but there was uh, less, uh, f fewer transactions and the volume has uh, declined. W where do you stand on, where, where do you think that this will have some ripple effect uh, moving forward? Or or it will subside and uh, the market will move on to the next uh, thing and just look at the monetary policy and the big uh, picture kind of thing. Well, we had the two reactions from the ECB on this, and this is what moves currencies most. So uh, one member, Peter Pratt, said uh, that there are further downside risks because of the Paris attacks. Okay, so that was, of course, and if you have more downside risks, you have more ECB intervention, you have a weaker euro, and you have also higher stocks because the ECB is flooding the markets even more. Okay. Okay, so that's one direction of speculation. The other direction came from Eve Mersch, another member of the ECB. He said it's too early to say, and I think yeah, in the, his opinion is more correct because these are early days. Uh, so in this case, it's just meaningless for markets. In the longer term, if we have a state of emergency in France, it was extended to three months. And at some point, if we have a suspension, a long-term suspension of the Schengen Agreement, which uh, enables free movement in the old continent, uh, this could have a, an impact. But for day-to-day -day markets, I don't see anything long-term. And if this is what causes the ECB to print more, then it's, of course, stocks positive. Mm, oh, okay. So maybe it will come from that kind of, uh, from that door. Uh, but if you look at it also from the perspective of a uh, all the risk involved in the markets and maybe the fear factor in Europe, uh, has it also, we, we have seen that the volume has declined. Maybe that will keep uh, this trend or at least keep volume low because maybe people are a little bit more occupied with other issues either, either than looking at the markets. You think that that could have some, uh, maybe not in uh, prices, but maybe in volume that uh, this kind of a uh, negative reaction could uh, maybe stay a little bit longer. No, I think people have a very short attention span, uh, less than it was maybe a few years ago, always looking for the next thing, always some kind of distraction, some kind of notification on the mobile phone, uh, more news happening, it's news is more accessible via Twitter. So yeah, we had the tragic uh, the attacks on Friday night. We had uh, manhunt that was concluded yesterday morning in Saint-Denis in northern Paris. We had uh, France bombarding Syria. Of course, there were quite a few developments afterwards but at some point um, I think uh, the market's attention unless we have hopefully not uh, another event of such magnitude the the aftershocks will be much much weaker I believe and the destruction of this event will move away there will be other perhaps other distractions to markets or perhaps um, uh, for the old continent the ECB meeting on December 3rd will uh, have more focus yeah and we'll talk about it as we come closer towards it so let's move from one uh, tragic event Event to completely different uh, without any segue, just move completely to the other direction to the US and the minutes of the FOMC that were released this week. Uh, I think, in one word, is a snoozer, right? One of the worst. Uh, <laughs> worst, <laughs> worst, <laughs> worst minutes ever. Yeah, uh, just we had some action in markets. We had the US dollar strengthen before the event because we had a few Fed speakers uh, talking about liftoff in December. And then we had the minutes, which revealed, I think, markets had expected uh, some kind of an even more hawkish stance and we didn't get that we got we got more of the same what did the Fed do, uh, do tell us uh, they tell us we had them saying that they wanted to change the wording in order to give us a hint that December a rate, a rate hike in December was on the cards so that's not news we already got that hint uh, it's no. like someone explaining a joke that means the joke failed and in this case it was it's meaningless it was just not necessary yeah um, did they actually do you think that they actually revised the minutes or 
it seems as if uh, the minutes weren't revised to account for the pretty positive NFP report from uh, earlier this month. Um, no, um, it's hard. It's hard to say because their paragraphs regarding employment were not were sort of close to the statement, close to saying. Oh, where, okay. um, yeah, in, in recent months it slowed down, and but the general trend is positive. Uh, Slack is diminishing, and, and also if you look at that, uh, also before the strong NFP we had in. Uh, for October and early November, and and also afterwards, the same could be said. I mean, if you look at the three-month average, it's still lower uh, for August, September, and. October and if the Fed looks long term it doesn't focus on one event so no there wasn't anything uh, really earth shattering so we had a stronger dollar before and the weakening of the dollar afterwards basically changes were not huge mm, okay so we so we didn't get any new information as to where the Fed is uh, taking us next month it's still gonna be uh, just let's wait and see it's still the main event will be probably what the NFP report that will be maybe if it will see another strong report will pretty much uh, put the kibosh on whether or not the Fed will raise rates it will be pretty much more definitive that uh, they are moving toward that goal right I think that if you look at the implied probability in bond markets and if you also look at what Fed speakers are saying even the dovish ones are sort of accepting a rate hike in December so you would need a really terrible report or an international disaster to prevent a rate hike so it's uh, the default is yes for a hike and if if that becomes um, if we have more good news and more Fed speakers saying that, of course, the chances will rise, but it will also change, I think, the market's focus on 2016, on the pace of uh, the rate hikes. What Yellen has been saying all the time, all this graduality. So maybe finally markets will begin listing and not focus only on the timing of the first hike. Uh, but it's um, still early to say that. Yeah, still early. Let me just enjoy the rate hike first. You're already pushing me forward towards uh, the pace. Come on, let me enjoy the first rate hike, Yochai. Teaser, teaser, yeah. <laughs> yeah, always the teaser, man. All right, yeah. and before that, we have uh, next week, we have thanks giving we uh, the royal we of course uh, in the u.s and uh, parts of europe they'll celebrate uh, thanksgiving and uh, it also uh, brings to mind how the market uh, reacts how the market moves and uh, behaves uh, during this uh, period usually it uh, i think not usually it's like all the time right it uh, happens on friday on the uh, thursday and then there's black friday in the u.s and then monday everybody goes back to work it's business as usual right yeah officially friday is um, they were when people work but uh, basically it's uh, also a holiday we don't have any events uh, any economic indicators from the United States on Friday so basically it's a three day work week a busy one and then uh, a long weekend of four days yeah. and then Monday everything uh, goes back to normal and people go back to work so we looked at uh, the S&P 500 uh, from the past uh, eight years and we looked at uh, the market's uh, movement of the S&P a few days a couple of days before Thanksgiving and a couple of days after Thanksgiving. So it's on Friday and Monday. And um, what we found was that if you look at uh, two things, let's look at volume and on average percent daily change during those uh, days. So two days before, we see that actually on average compared to the years 2007 to 2015, the average volume, we see that uh, there is a spike in volume traded around a 42% higher than regular. One day before Thanksgiving, it's around 19%. And then the day after Thanksgiving, a Friday, it drops to 30 by 34% on average. So as you expect, you said it's a working day, markets are open, but nobody's in the market. And the following business day on Monday, uh, you see that volume does uh, pick up and it's uh, roughly 33% higher than average. So from the volume perspective, we do see that there is pretty much a clear trend. You see that uh, a couple of days before it's higher on friday it's lower then on monday it does uh, pick up but when we look at the average percent changes then there's a little bit more interesting things to consider for one you look at two days before pretty much solid there's nothing there's no trend it goes down a little bit by 0.1 percent that's like 10 pips that's nothing uh, also you look at it it's roughly like 50 percent to go up to go down in the past eight years so nothing uh, too impressive one day before thanksgiving it goes up by 0.3%, which is also not too impressive, but 
when you look at how often does the, the S&P rise to one day before Thanksgiving, it's roughly 75% of the time. So it's a little bit more compelling. That's a clear tendency, yeah. Yeah, but uh, again, there's not too much meat on this bone because uh, it's not a, it's a small it's a small gain. So it does re it does tend to rise uh, more often, but by a small margin. Hmm. One day after Thanksgiving, it goes up by 0.11%. Again, nothing too impressive. And also the chances of going up, it's a 38%. So it's not, hmm. as I said, it's close to 50%. It's nothing too impressive. But the final point, which I think is a little bit more interesting, is that on Monday, the two business days after Thanksgiving, when uh, we say that volume does uh, pick up again, there's a decline, an average decline of a 1.16%. So it's a pretty, uh, pretty steep uh, fall on average. And uh, if you look at the chances, the chances of a decline is roughly 75%. So we do see that it's more often than not for the market to fall on Monday after Thanksgiving. Mm -hmm. And also it does fall on average by a little bit uh, more, much more higher than uh, than what we you would expect on normal days uh, by almost 1.2% average daily change. That's a pretty uh, tall order for that kind of Yeah, day. so it's sometimes called Cyber Monday. I mean, they try to market it as a day where people go shopping online, which I'm not sure is the case because everybody shops online all the time, yeah. including in the full week. But anyway, perhaps what could explain this, maybe the actual result Results from retail sales on Black Friday are disappointing, and then the markets fall, or is yeah. it some kind of market hangover? Or yeah, it could be. It could be something. Uh, something a little bit of both. Maybe because, as you said, the, maybe the, it's not always that the markets do react as well as one would expect when it comes to retail sales. Uh, maybe in the recent years, it uh, they were a little bit more disappointing than normal. So maybe the market reacts to that. And also, there is also the matter of. Uh, don't forget that we are saying that there there is a high volume of trading on that day after uh, that there was a pretty much a decline on uh, in volume traded uh, on Friday. So maybe there is a little bit more of a correction of the first of uh, the day before and day after uh, Thanksgiving that tend to rise and uh, there is a little bit more of a correction, a little bit more harsher than uh, one would expect. But it's something that uh, we should take into account. Also, there is also again i need to put a little bit more than a grain of salt into it because on um, we're looking at the volume traded the average on the december 1st 2008 that's the day when the market crashed by nine percent so <laughs> you have to take that in account as well when you look at the averages that's the problem with averages i mean but uh, also in 2007 it was still uh, the market started to fall but uh, and there was a decline of two point three percent on uh, 2009 a one point seven percent decline so yeah it's usually there is a, a pretty steep fall uh, on the day after it's not consistent it's not all the time but it does tend to happen more often than none and um, in the past if you look at just at the past uh, four or five years after 2009 let's say then you do see that uh, it's a little bit less dramatic than it was uh, well, in, movements during in gen general were less dramatic yeah, yeah. After, in the years after the first year or so, no? Yeah, yeah, after the subsequent years, after 2007, 8 and 9, if you look after those three years, then you see a little bit uh, different uh, average and it does go down uh, substantially. It's still more often than not that we will see a decline. I mean, not will see. I mean, there tended to be more uh, often than not a decline in prices. Of course, uh, past performance doesn't, uh, doesn't predict uh, future performance, so we should take it with a pinch of salt. So so there's still, but it's something that does uh, help to give us a little bit more of an insight as to what uh, markets, how do markets tend to react during these time of day, especially with, with you take into account the volume that is traded and uh, it does yeah. uh, tend to uh, shift. Uh, yeah. do, do you think that we will see something probably similar? Maybe we'll do another thing about it when we look at the, uh, about the um, Christmas, right? That's something we should take into yeah, account also. it's a much bigger uh, holiday. I mean, markets are basically closed and it's, it's worldwide. 
it's not only in the United States. So yeah, that's of course that's the most important uh, holiday on the calendar. So yeah, yeah so we, we should Christmas see a reaction. And New Year's, of course, yeah. Yeah, so we should re uh, probably and uh, maybe even harsher reaction. We'll uh, check it out before going to the holidays, and uh, we'll report you guys what's uh, what's the verdict if we see something similar to what's happening on Thanksgiving. Maybe it's a trend. We'll have to wait and see. But to remember, as always, take it with a pinch of salt. But yeah. uh, from that, let's move to the main events of the week. So, Yochai, what's on the agenda? What's on the docket? Yeah, well, uh, first of all, um, we have, as we said, a busy week towards Thanksgiving. On Monday, it's, well, it's not that busy. We have PMIs from Europe, which are important forward-looking indices and provide more uh, details on... Uh, of, the, of these uh, manufacturing PMIs, you think that uh, the German is the one most uh, interesting to look at or the yeah. one that most moves the markets? Yeah, out of the six figures we have, uh, manufacturing and services from France, Germany, and the Eurozone preliminary numbers for November, the German one is the most... German manufacturing one is the most important because that's... The because they country. still manufacture because and they still manufacture yeah that's the country that actually manufactures <laughs> and it's the biggest country in the eurozone and in the context of the volkswagen crisis let's see if uh, purchasing managers in germany uh, see some kind of a downturn so far they've they have been relatively optimistic let's see if this continues we have also eurogroup meetings we talk about Greece, still in the back burner, but perhaps in December we'll have more interesting stuff from Greece. Tuesday, well, again, Germany with the IFO report. Uh, let's see if they show this business survey from the locomotive of the Eurozone. Uh, also completes the information from the PMIs, also for November. And then the big event on Tuesday yeah, is... Yeah, the GDP. Yeah, the first revision or the second estimate uh, it was 1.5% last time. Let's see if it changes uh, to the upside or to the downside. I have no to, no no idea. no you have to say the dark side or the or the light side right in the yeah. Because we have a Star Wars next month. Don't forget oh, right, that. Right, right, yeah. Yeah, hmm. yeah. Yeah. What do you what do you think? It's gonna be more or less than one and a half percent? I think it's gonna be a bit more positive, but not not I mean if you look at goods if you look at a few minor data releases such as inventories and things like that, they've been relatively positive. So that could be I mean my estimation is a small upside revision, but who knows? It's always such a wild card like the NFP, so it can go uh, either know. way. Yeah. Yeah. And either okay. way ended by big percent not a small one so let's see okay anyway, we have also one. consumer confidence right yeah that's much more forward looking not hard data from the past but rather uh, current data for november uh that's on tuesday as well and wednesday just before the holiday as you said volume is up on the s p and i believe also that in currency markets will have much more action here we have hard data durables goods orders for october um this uh, figure disappointed so many times in the past year um, especially in core durables goods orders that showed basically reflected a lack of investment uh, we also have the core pc price index important for uh, the fed regarding inflation and no change around 1.3 i believe we'll see there and jobless claims the weekly release but everything is sort of crammed in together and that will uh, create sort of and new home sales as well on that day so it's all in all a very sort of uh, crowded uh, day before the holiday in the united wow. states mm, okay what else do we have on the agenda we have on the uh, also so the when it comes to the EU, uh, the money supply, do you actually uh, follow it or you think it's, uh, yeah, you have the CPI, you don't need to look at the, the money supply changes? The ECB looks at it, so also I follow it, and, and there we do see some improvement in the situation in the past year or two. Because yeah, yeah, we saw in the last year, I saw, I saw, I think I saw that the, the M1, the M3, they have gone up, and the, after after they have been pretty much remained pretty flat for, for several years. Yeah, that's right, so it was around flat, now it's just under 5%, that means that more there's an accelerated velocity of money, if you wish, and private loans, they were actually negative, falling year over year which is of course the negative sign for the economy now they're up one percent and this is mostly a result of the ecb's policy cheaper money uh, more liquidity for banks more lending more money in circulation that unfortunately for them doesn't translate into uh, real inflation yeah that's the thing something somewhere around along the way from the m1 m3 all the way to inflation 
then something along the way has uh, gone wrong and uh, you don't see that uh, it translates to higher inflation even though it's supposed to be a good indicator of inflation but we actually don't see it actually there is some disattachment yeah well that can be explained by first of all money going out of the eurozone because banks are basically punished to uh, park money with the ecb and in addition well there is a cheaper euro which is of course good for exports so that's another outcome of the ecb's policy and uh, some of the money is just going into is creating inflation elsewhere in in stocks in housing well very selective housing if i may say or perhaps housing in london <laughs> and not oh, the eurozone okay. uh, but uh, so, so basically are... so maybe basically maybe you're saying that uh, it's just uh, exported all this inflation all this is just exported outside so people in europe don't see it some of it is exported and so in the homegrown inflation is just not in in what's measured as inflation it's just in uh, stock prices in the eurozone i don't think they're bubbly they were depressed but um that's uh, the ecb's like in the united states the qe policy eventually lifts stocks uh and sends money out of the country and we're seeing i think both phenomena here in the eurozone mm, okay there's anything else on the agenda uh yeah we have the cpi german cpi preliminary on thursday and this is also more important for the ecb and uh, the same in spain on friday and then yeah and then on friday we have in the uk the second estimate of gdp but here changes are not that big like in the united states so it was 0.5 last time and perhaps it'll be around the same number so i would focus more on if you're not in the United States and you want to trade, not on Thanksgiving holiday, I would focus more on the uh, European inflation figures. Okay, that's good. Sounds good to me. Okay, thank you as usual, Yochain. Thank you, Lior. Thank you all for listening. If you like our show, give us a five-star rating on iTunes and you can subscribe to the show via Stitcher, email, RSS, or iTunes, whatever suits you fancy. So until next week, this is Lior signing off for Yochain, saying have a great week and rest responsibly. This podcast should be used for educational, research, and informational purposes only and does not constitute investment advice. There are no guarantees expressed or implied of future positive returns in regard to the subject matter contained herein. Understand the risks inherent in investing before making the decision to invest or consult an investment professional for more information. A reasonable due diligence has been performed in regards to the information in this podcast. However, the hosts and guests of this podcast expressly disclaim any liability for accidental omissions of information or errors in fact. For comments, suggestions, and questions, visit the podcast page at forexcrunch.com or tradingnrg.com, where you can also find past episodes and subscribe to the show. Our listeners make market movers possible. <laughs>